My name's Josh Smith. I'm a professor at the United States Merchant Marine Academy in Kings Point, New York. I'm also director of the American Merchant Marine Museum, which is located on the grounds of the U.S. Merchant Marine Academy. I'm, I'm, I'm sort of doubly blessed. I've got a, a PhD, I'm a maritime historian, and I get to teach maritime historians who are fantastic students here who we call midshipmen. Uh, and I also get to direct this museum, which is in this glorious mansion overlooking Long Island Sound. One of the things I do, both as a scholar and as a museum director, is I try to explain to people what the Merchant Marine is. And a lot of people want to make it simple, but the fact of the matter is the Merchant Marine is just complicated. Many people want to think it is a service, sort of like a military service. Well, it can look that way. And certainly here at the U.S. Merchant Marine Academy, you know, you have a lot of people in uniforms. There are people marching, saluting. There are flags. Um, it looks military. Yet we're, we're not. We're something different. We're actually part of the Maritime Administration, which is a part of the U.S. Department of Transportation, which is currently led by Secretary of Transportation Pete Buttigieg. So what is the Merchant Marine? It's not a service, but it has a flag, it has a song, it has an academy. Boy, if, if it walks like a duck and it talks like a duck, it's a duck, right? Well, no. <laughs> it's something different. It's really about the strategic utility of shipping for the good of the nation. And that works, as we say in the Merchant Marine, in both peace and war. In peacetime, American flag ships are supporting the American economy and making us a strong nation. It's also allowing us to do things like to deliver foreign aid effectively through grain cargoes or to help out uh, nations that have sudden emergencies, say a tsunami or an earthquake or a hurricane. And, and that's true for here in the United States too, that we use ships to help people when you know, things really go sideways. In wartime, the Merchant Marine supports the military. And let me backtrack there a little bit because the Merchant Marine also supports the military in peacetime as well. There are a lot of ships actually owned by the Navy or the government or simply contracted out that move all the supplies for the American military. And that includes vehicles and equipment and, and all sorts of things that the military needs, and that becomes even more important during wartime. And this is probably where people have heard about the Merchant Marine the most. In World War II, the American Merchant Marine was huge. The government built literally thousands of cargo ships to bring supplies to our forces and the forces of our allies all around the world. And for a brief time, the United States had the largest merchant fleet in the world. Uh, and uh, without these ships, many of them called Liberty ships, a sort of emergency class of ship or uh, tankers or you know, any, anything that, 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 that floated and could carry stuff, um, it would really have been impossible for the United States to have emerged victorious from World War II. So it's a, a, a very, a, a subtle and complex idea. So don't look for simple answers about it. The, the glorious moment for the American Merchant Marine has for a long time always been considered World War II, where the American merchant fleet, the ships, becomes the largest in the world. And there are at least a quarter million merchant mariners uh, manning those ships. Some estimates go over 400,000. Uh, and just because you're operating on a non-combatant ship doesn't mean it's not dangerous. These American merchant ships are going all over the world. So that could be the Murmansk Run, which was a very dangerous route to the northernmost ports in the Soviet Union. Uh, and you're exposed to Arctic ice and all the horrific conditions that the Arctic can throw you even as the Nazis are hunting you down with U-boats 
and aircraft, an incredibly dangerous thing. And these merchant mariners who were doing this were, were not part of a service that, you know, they, they signed up. Uh, if they belong to anything, they're actually members of a labor union, uh, which is probably not recognized as much as it should be, frankly. Other dangerous areas, merchant mariners are in the Pacific as well. When the Philippines fell to the Japanese in 1942, merchant mariners were there. Uh, minutes before the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor, they torpedoed a merchant ship called the Cynthia Olson off Hawaii, uh, which by the way, the entire crew died in that attack and they only got off a very brief radio message so we know anything about that at all. Uh, American mariners were dying before the United States got into World War II. Our ships were being torpedoed or mined or otherwise attacked uh, by German forces all over the world. So the Merchant Marine is in some regards a story of sacrifice. And for a portion of the war, especially the early part of the war, 1942, where the US was not engaged in offensive operations, we were still on the defensive, uh, and the Germans began to torpedo our merchant ships right off our own very coast, and I am talking about within sight of our own shores, that these merchant mariners were dying in, in large numbers. And at this point in the war, more merchant mariners were dying on a monthly basis than members of the armed forces. Well, why is that? Well, because the armed forces weren't actually invading or on the offensive anywhere yet. We were building up and getting ready for that attack. But merchant mariners will continue uh, to suffer high casualties throughout the war, and indeed, their ships will suffer uh, after the war as well because there are literally millions of mines floating in the ocean. So as late as 1949, uh, American merchant marine vessels are, get, are hitting mines uh, and getting damaged. So uh, really an unbelievably dangerous environment. So who are these, these merchant mariners who man these ships? Well, it, in my mind, there are sort of two generations. There are the guys before the war who are really fascinating. These guys were professional mariners. Uh, this is what they did. This was their whole life. They had sailed in the 30s. They had fought, in some cases literally fought, to create labor unions that improved their working conditions and made them get treated like real human beings. Uh, and those guys were pretty quiet. They were working class guys. Um, and in some cases, you know, some of the more rabid union guys were frankly you know, communists, uh, which may sound alarming. But uh, those radical merchant mariners were also the guys who were saying, hey, you know what? All races are equal. And hey, I am due the dignity of a living paycheck for doing an honest day's work. Or, hey, why are you, you know, harassing uh, African Americans or gay steward staff or whatever? They're really fighting for rights. And in fact, a lot of these guys go to Europe to the Spanish Civil War and they are fighting the fascists. They join up voluntarily in Spain to fight fascism while most Americans are sitting back at home, comfortable as can be, and isolationists and don't want to have anything to do with this war. So there is a certain nobility to these working guys, these union guys, and they make very little complaint when the war comes up. They're just continuing what they're doing. But they do teach the newbies who come on board, and there are tens of thousands of newbies coming on board these ships because there's a desperate need for merchant mariners. So the government will train merchant mariners uh, and they put them out on these brand new ships, many of them Liberty ships, uh, and these are kids, many of them. Uh, and when I say kids, I think you could join the merchant marine as young as 16 by the end of the war. And of course, teenage boys being what they are, some, some lie and get, get on board earlier. Um, there are also very old guys who are asked to come back to sea. There's a very famous poster 
uh, from World War II of a merchant seaman with a sea bag over his back saying, you know, darn right, I'm going back to sea. That's not an appeal to young guys. That's, that's an appeal to guys who had, as they say, swallowed the anchor. They had come ashore, and they had a life on shore, and the government saying, we need you. Come back. So there are young boys as young as 15. There are old guys as old as 75 out there. Um, and the difference is, is that a lot of the young guys who went to these government training programs, they're really doing it as their war service. This is their patriotic chore, um, and they don't have much intention to sail after the war, although you know, some do. And they have a very different idea of what their war service was. For, for the old generation, it was just, this is what we do. Uh, but the younger guys, are much more invested in this idea that we are veterans too, right? We faced torpedoes, we faced all the dangers, yet at the end of the Second World War, they do not get the recognition, they do not get the veterans' benefits of those who had signed up into the armed services. And there's some protests, you know, there's signs and uh, demonstrations to a certain extent um, but they're crippled by a couple things. Um, the first is, is that there, there are some people who are unsettled by the union politics of uh, maritime labor unions. And they're upset that, you know, it's the late 40s, it's the early Cold War, they're upset that there may be communists, socialists, or other fellow travelers in, in the merchant marine. And there were some, you know, aspersions thrown at merchant mariners during the war uh, that somehow they weren't quite respectable, uh, were, were sort of draft-dodging bums, and that they were cashing in on the war. None of which was, was, was really true. Uh, so that's one problem. There is the reputation of the Merchant Mariner back then was, was not necessarily so good. The other problem is, is that President Franklin D. Roosevelt had died before the war even ended. And he was a big fan of the Merchant Marine. He had been, as a young man, a very effective Assistant Secretary of the Navy. As the President of the United States, uh, after 1932, all the way up to his death in 1945, he had been a big advocate for the Navy. And uh, what we like to point out here at the U.S. Merchant Marine Academy is he founded this institution, right, which uh, is formally founded in 1943. It's really in operation before then. But uh, the point is, is that FDR was a big proponent of sea power in general, including the Merchant Marine, and there is some evidence that he intended to support Merchant Marine veterans after the war, tragically, he died of natural causes just before the war ended. So with those two problems, um, merchant mariners don't really get recognized. And that means they're not getting guaranteed student loans uh, or home mortgages or other benefits that uh, armed forces veterans rightfully received. Um, you know, there, there's no feeling that armed forces veterans shouldn't have these benefits. The, the problem is the omission of merchant mariners. And that continued for many years uh, until 1988, when there's a, a court case, and this finally gets rectified, and merchant mariners do get recognized as veterans. That's a legal status bestowed by Congress, and it's only certain merchant mariners, it's only the deep water guys between, you know, I think sometime in 1939 and then at the end of 1946, and you had to go overseas, and you know, there, there, there were conditions. Uh, but it, uh, it doesn't provide much in the way of material benefits, uh, and many merchant mariners still felt sort of cheated. But of course, by 1988, a lot of these guys are passing on uh, from natural causes. And their numbers are getting fewer and fewer. They do pull off this big victory in 1988, but I think the Congressional Gold Medal for Merchant Mariners of World War II is, an, is a final effort to say, wow, the, the nation is grateful 
for your services in World War II. Uh, and Congress is minting this one beautiful gold coin uh, to commemorate this service. And uh, the sad thing is, is very few merchant mariners from the war will be around to receive a facsimile of that coin. Um, but boy, their descendants sure are interested uh, in getting a facsimile of, of that coin.